Welcome ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? Welcome to a brand new episode of VR365. It is Friday, it is January 15th. The year is 2021. I don't know, have I done an episode this year? I think my episode was, uh, the last episode I did I think was New Year's Eve actually. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did it on a Friday, or was that a Thursday? Anyways, I don't really remember, but yeah, we are back with a brand new episode of VR365. I've got a number of different topics to get into today. Of course, we also have chat as well. I will be trying to check chat on a little bit of a more frequent basis than normal. But what we're going to get in today, folks, is we're going to talk about a couple of upcoming VR headsets that are knocking on the door, so to speak. So we're going to be talking about Samsung. We're also going to be talking about Panasonic. We're also going to talk about a couple of different experiences, VR experiences, Battle Scar. Yes, I tried it. I've actually tried Battle Scar the entire 30 minute or whatever it was uh, experience featuring Rosario Dawson, uh, the voice. And so I will be talking about that a little bit later. I'm going to talk about a homelessness experience called We Live Here, which I thought was pretty interesting. We'll, we'll be talking about that later. I'm also going to talk a little bit more about Rackin' NX for the Oculus Quest, which I continue to believe is the single best Oculus Quest game currently available, bar none, bar none, the very best Oculus Quest game. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Jurassic World Aftermath, continue to kind of mess around with that a little bit, and some other odds and ends. For example, we do have the release date for uh, Gorn, for Oculus Quest, that has been revealed as well, and just some other odds and ends. So why don't we go ahead and get into it? And so the lead story of the day, uh, as I get back into my proper area here, the lead story of the day, of course, is Samsung. And basically, we've got some more information that has come from Samsung. Well, not exactly from Samsung. I believe it's from like Let's Go Digital, a German website. And these are the same people that leaked the original Samsung information. These are possibly renders that are from patent applications. Um, so when this all came to light in the last couple of days, I don't remember exactly what day this all hit. It's been a while. When this all came to light, it's like, oh yeah, what about the Samsung bug -o vision You guys remember that? I did an episode and I was curious. I was like, when was that episode? When did I do this episode on Samsung bug -o vision is what I called it. And I thought that was just the most obvious name ever because you look like some kind of bug. You know, this is like, we all talk about the UFOs are coming, right? The UFOs, disclosure, the CIA releasing their documents. Well, there are praying mantis UFO people. And I think one of their headsets fell out of their spaceship. And this was in South Korea. Samsung grabbed it and put a Samsung logo on it. That's pretty much what we've got going on here with Bugovision. And we did an episode talking about this it was like a year ago. This was like January 20-something last year. So it's been a year since bug -o vision Bug-O-Vision first happened. And we had speculation back then about bug -o vision but we didn't really know very much. And we still don't know that much, but I think the timing is interesting. Um, and we do have a few more images to work with here. This is, of course, a rear image of the headset. You can see we do have built-in audio, which is becoming a popular trend among VR headsets. I think it's pretty ideal if you can have 
relatively decent built-in audio up to the level of, say, Oculus CV1 or possibly the deluxe audio strap. As long as it's pretty decent on the built-in audio, I think it's a good idea because then you no longer have the two-step process of putting on the VR headset, then putting on your headphones, finding the little connector, plugging it in. So it's definitely a nice thing to have the built-in audio there. We can see the back of it, the kind of uh, design that it's using. Don't know if it's incredibly comfortable, but yeah, these are some of the newest shots. But really, the most exciting thing of all of this, of course, is the new shots of controllers. Well, the first shots that we've ever had of brand new controllers, and this is easily the most exciting thing in this whole entire deal. Because here's the deal, when we're talking about Samsung and we're talking about VR, we have to talk about Windows Mixed Reality. I've made this comment a number of times that Samsung and Microsoft have a very tight-knit relationship. It has nothing to do with VR. It has things to do with other things that are unrelated to VR. But Samsung and Microsoft are really tight. And this concerned me. This was a worry of mine because the bottom line is Microsoft seems completely uninterested in virtual reality. They created Windows Mixed Reality 1.0, a template very similar to the Qualcomm template that Qualcomm created with those seven concurrent cameras and the super high resolution. We've still seen nothing from that, but that's another story. But Windows Mixed Reality by Microsoft was a template that they then provided to third-party companies and said, hey, would you like to make a VR headset? Well, here's the template. All you got to do is follow the template. You make the controllers the same. You make the headsets the same. You could put your own logo on it. You could add your own spin to the body of it or to the design of it, but it is essentially under the Windows Mixed Reality template. Well, that template has been stuck at 1.0. Yes, despite everybody that has their Reverb G2s and everybody that's super excited about the Hewlett Packard Reverb G2, that's not Windows Mixed Reality 1. or 2.0. That is not Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. I wish it was. I absolutely wish it was. If it was really Windows Mixed Reality 2.0, we would have brand new controller designs, brand new tracking algorithms. It wouldn't just be two cameras being added on just for some extra volume, extra tracking volume. It would be a complete reworking of the system. The system would be more robust. The algorithm would be better. Possibly uh, it, would, it would move away from visible light and use different kinds of technologies. So that's what we were hoping with Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. It didn't happen. And because Samsung and Microsoft are so closely linked together, this caused me a lot of concern because I felt like Samsung could not just go down their own private road because they would piss off potentially Microsoft and they have this tight relationship. But we're seeing controllers here and these look to be completely redesigned controllers. The other thing that we're noticing here is there is a, um, well, in this shot, you don't really see it. Let me go ahead and switch back over here. Now, there is a little logo that is showing up in these pictures, and that is the Samsung Odyssey logo. For example, if we switch over here uh, to the webinar, and we look at this picture here. Okay, this is Samsung Odyssey. You can see Odyssey has its own particular little logo. That's the logo that they have for the Samsung Odyssey line of products. And that logo is featured on this headset in a number of different places. As you can see, it's featured on the bottom side of the controller there. And I'm not sure if it's also on that little thumbstick nub. We're gonna be talking about the buttons and all of that. This is incredibly interesting, but it's really a break. You know, this is a dramatic break from Windows Mixed Reality 1.0. So the bottom line here is one of two things are happening. Either 
This is Mixed Reality 2.0. This is the first leaked images of Windows Mixed Reality 2.0 controllers. Maybe this is the template. Maybe we will see these controllers being used by Hewlett Packard, being used by Asus and Acer and other possible Windows Mixed Reality 1.0 manufacturers. There could be an entirely new set of headsets that are coming out with a new template, a new spec, new minimum resolutions, new tracking capabilities, new inside out technology. It could be that. The other possibility is that Samsung has basically said, hey, Microsoft, look, you guys have Windows Mixed Reality 1.0. We like it a lot, but you know what? We have a more advanced VR headset that we really want to bring to market and we don't want to use Windows Mixed Reality 1.0. Are you guys working on 2.0? Oh, you're not? Okay, well, would, would you be bothered if we like went off on our own little tangent here and went crazy with it? Would that really upset you? Oh, no, it wouldn't upset you? Okay, then great, we're going to go do that. So it's basically one of those two things. This is Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. This is a leak or Samsung is creating their own setup. Either way, it is very interesting. Either way, it is very interesting. But, um, whoops, I'm in the wrong spot here. But yeah, I want to go back to the controllers because this is the new information that we have. And it's certainly the most interesting information that we have so far. And the, the number one thing that jump, jumps out at you at this thing is the location of the tracking ring. Or is it? Or is it? Is this a tracking ring, ladies and gentlemen? Because you look closely at the tracking ring, I'm not seeing any lights anywhere. I'm not seeing any kind of diodes or any sort of illumination, whether it's infrared, whether it's visible light. I'm not seeing any of that. Okay, so this could be a completely new kind of tracking mechanism that Samsung is using. And so remember when I was saying a year ago, a year ago, I did a show about bug vision Well, there was a comment on that episode. I, I happened to be looking at that recently, and I was looking at the comments, and one of the comments jumped out at me, and it was by Derail Gaming. Now, this was 11 months ago. And he was talking about the camera placement, which we thought was a little bit odd, the way the cameras were situated on Bugovision. vision And he basically said that um, the camera placement made him think that they're using their magnetic controller patent. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we might be seeing an entirely new technology here. Well, not new, but new to mass market VR in terms of magnetic controller tracking, a different sort of a tracking, um, magnetic instead of going with visual optics. And so then that changes the game. This, you know, we really could be looking at uh, a real difference here when the controllers are tracked completely differently from the headset this frees up the headset cameras to do other things, possibly some uh, better pass-through, possibly full-color pass-through. These types of things are possible. Uh, so the tracking ring was the first thing that jumped out, but it might not be a tracking ring. And so the, the most interesting thing about it is you're basically going to have to put your hand through that tracking ring to then grab onto the controller. So the tracking ring is going to be around your wrist in a way. And that also made me think, huh, is it going to somehow sense the way your wrist muscles are operating? Although I don't think we're this advanced yet. But I can imagine a future, there's been talk that you could have a band that would wrap around your wrist and it would measure extremely tiny movements in, in your wrist muscles and tendons that relate to the movement of your fingers for perfect finger tracking, which would be based on something that goes around your wrist. Now, that's probably not what we're looking at here, um, but it is something interesting nonetheless but the controller itself 
You know, the controller does spark a lot of controversy. I also mentioned this on my Discord server. It kind of looked like, you know, I talked about Bugovision falling out of a UFO, the praying mantis UFO people. Well, this controller looks like it fell out of a UFO. Very unconventional design. Now, we do see that there is a grip button on the side. Um, it's more like by this part of your hand here where you would kind of push this in for your grip. You, of course, have the trigger at the top. You have a PlayStation Vita-esque nub, a mini nub. How do you guys feel about the mini nub? Not in love with the mini nub. I got to tell you, man, I, I want a real thumbstick, all right? We want real thumbsticks. I'm not super hyped on the mini nub, but it appears that we have a PS Vita mini nub. It appears that we have one action button, a single action button. Okay, then we have a multi-purpose trackpad. And the multi-purpose trackpad, of course, could have multiple regions that register a press. And so those could be different buttons. They could be different kind of, uh, basically depending on the game, it can switch up. We've seen this before. We've had the Vive Wands uh, since April of 2016. So we've had trackpads before. They have some nice uses, but do we sacrifice a full-size thumbstick to get the capabilities of these track of the trackpad and are we happy with a single action button Ugh, i don't know i don't know that i'm very happy with this there's a lot of vr games that you would play that use two different primary buttons and now one of those buttons has been compromised. You've got the one primary button, and then the other buttons are gonna be on the trackpad, or possibly pushing in the little mini nub as a button. I'm guessing you could probably push that in as well. It has the light on the end of it, not sure exactly what that's all about, or if that is just the Odyssey logo. Uh, so anyway, let me go ahead and check and see what some people are talking about in chat over here as we continue to move through here. And Pseudo Soul says, oh shit, magnetic mind control, Illuminati confirmed. Um, Duck Dive Dodge says, I only just realized that the picture on the left is the underside of the controller showing the trigger. Uh, Pseudo Soul also talks about magnetic handcuffs. Um, Tony is the magnetic PI. Uh, Paul P. Jr. says, I think it's an old patent, not going to be the next headset. Uh, well, these images, we've never seen them before. And, and I don't know. I don't think these images, to me, these images don't look like just random. Like, this doesn't look like you're screwing around here. This looks like a finalized finished type product to me you know when we're looking at all the various images that we have from uh samsung uh these different bugo vision images it feels like you know this is getting much closer and closer to fruition and i gotta tell you guys uh let me see here um i want to switch to i'm gonna try switching to oops not that one um let's see here uh Sorry about that. I messed up. I screwed up one of my one of my deals here. So I'm going to go I'm going to go back over here. So anyway, I wanted to go off on another little tangent related to this whole Samsung thing. Dude, this is incredible. How freaking perfect is this? Because do you guys remember on my very last episode of VR365, which is damn near 2 weeks ago basically, I sold my Valve Index um, it, on Christmas Eve, yeah, Christmas Eve, I believe, I sold my Valve Index and walked away from the Valve Index. I do not have a daily driver, ladies and gentlemen. And the reason I did this is I had a premonition. I was sleeping one night and in my dreams, Bugovision came to me. No, but honestly, I really felt like we are overdue for an incredible new VR headset to come into the game, a disruptor that can come in and possibly change things. I believe we're long overdue for this. And so I sold my Valve Index and I thought, well, yeah, this is gonna put me in an uncomfortable situation, but you know what? Maybe in another month, 
some unknown VR headset is going to come out of the woodwork to shock it all. And everybody that's scrambling to get your Reverb G2 and you're scrambling to buy an Index and you're scrambling, now there's going to be an entirely new scramble because FOMO will be real. There will be some serious FOMO that will come with the next big VR headset that brings a lot to the table. And I got to tell you, my timing could not be more perfect, assuming that we do get a full-on announcement of this thing, a release date for this thing, uh, a pre-order time, time frame for this thing. So I am really excited about that aspect of it, no question about it. Um, you know, so definitely excited there. Now, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves, of course, though, when it comes to this entire thing, and I'm, I'm going to switch over here to a, a different video where I just have some different. This is the Bugo Vision stuff that I had a long time ago when we first broke the Bugo Vision scenario over a year ago or actually a little bit under a year ago. And there's kind of like two variations possibly. That's kind of a, a different side shot there. But we saw that, you know, we saw the integrated audio. We see the Kylo Ren. I don't know what this is all about, the Kylo Ren design. And then here we're seeing some of the patent images where again, we see the Odyssey logo there on the top. We can see there's four tracking cameras, but these cameras might have nothing to do with tracking the controllers. That's kind of exciting. These cameras might have nothing to do. There's also like a focus nub that is underneath, um, underneath it. And then this little video clip here, this is from a German trade show. I've ran this clip a number of times because Samsung has shown off high resolution screen capabilities. For example, a 2.43 inch screen here with a resolution of 3840 by 2160. That is the total resolution there. And if you break it down, it's not 2160 by 2160 per eye. It's 1920 by 2160 per eye would be the screen that they had there, which could which could actually be the screen that is in the Oculus Quest 2. And how do I get that, folks? Well, in the Oculus Quest 2, the resolution is 1830 by 1920, which seems like an oddball sort of resolution. But you got to remember, with the three different locations for the IPD, you have unused screen real estate that they cannot advertise as being part of the viewable resolution. So the screen that's in an Oculus Quest 2 could be this 1920 by 2160 Samsung made screen, this screen right here, that the resolution is effectively lowered because of these three different IPD locations. Now, I'm not saying this is like absolute locked, locked in stone kind of thing, but this screen's been around for a while. We've known about this screen, 250 nits, a little bit disappointing there. You can see it does operate up to 120 hertz um, natively. And so this was some of the old Bugo Vision information that we had um, the first time. And so, but, but, you know, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves about Samsung and Windows Mixed Reality and Microsoft is if you're in the game of making a PC VR headset, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're in the game of making a PC VR headset in this modern day VR gaming industry, it's very hard to compete on a real legitimate level, unless you have your own store, okay? If you don't have your own store, you really have no incentive to get crazy with this. There's no real incentive to do that. Now, Facebook, of course, has a ginormous incentive. They have their own store. They've built their store out. It's, they've got a ton of exclusive content. They're creating this entire library of exclusive content that isn't available anywhere else. So Facebook has an incentive going years into the future 
to create more and more advanced VR headsets and to potentially take losses on those headsets to sell them hundreds of dollars below the cost because they have their store where they can make it all up. They have their ecosystem. They lock you into their private Disneyland where a Coca-Cola costs $11 and a hot dog is $9.50. We've been there before, we've experienced it. Now, Samsung doesn't have a store and building a store from scratch not the easiest thing. I mean, of course, any manufacturer could create their own little store system, and, and a lot of them do, but unless you're gonna have some like exclusive content and stuff that comes to it, people are like, oh man, another password, another ecosystem, another like isolated area where my games are gonna be trapped within this area. So it becomes a whole entire issue there but unless you have a store you can't undercut enough to be able to have a, a really high-tech product that can compete and and that can be a, a bit problematic let me go ahead and here and check and see what some people are talking about in chat onakaze says that looks like break light turn signal diffusers for the bug eyes you don't want stuff breaking up the light for tracking um and uh let's see Paul P. Jr. said, Oculus helps Samsung with Gear VR. Onakaze says, it's kind of tough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Onakaze says, it's kind of tough to say how well Gear VR actually did. They crowed about numbers, but there were many sales and giveaways of the headset with the phones. No real hard numbers on return users. And Caleb Law with a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, Caleb. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, you know, we're not really sure what the deal is here with Samsung and Bugo Vision. Obviously, we definitely hope that we get a, a more legitimate announcement in the very near future. We want to get excited about this. We want to know about the resolution. I'm hopeful that the resolution is even higher than this particular uh, screen that was shown off. This was years ago. This was at a German show years ago. So I'm hoping they have an even more advanced screen that will be used here. The magnetic controller possibility is, is very interesting how that might open up some additional avenues. Um, we don't believe there's additional cameras inside for eye tracking and stuff like that. So we don't know that there will be any kind of breakthrough as far as that goes. Um, but yeah, the big question is controller buttons. One action button that could be a real downer i got to admit the controller button issue could potentially be a major friggin downer especially if this is like a new template if this is the template for windows mixed reality 2.0 and all these different headsets are going to have this design also the little mini nub the mini nub for the uh, thumbstick concerning as well does look pretty ergonomic it does look like it would fit you pretty ergonomically the trigger feels like it would be positioned in a very comfortable location the side grip button seems like that would work pretty well um so i'm okay with that i just wish they could squeeze i wish they just squeezed in one more action button um you know if there were two primary main buttons i think that would have been a world of difference so i am highly concerned about that but that is this brand new samsung headset we are excited to be sure okay um in other headset news we also of course have a reappearance you know it's one year later and so it seems like two different vr headsets are back in the news exactly one year after we found out about them the first time. Of course, this was at the January Consumer Electronics Show in 2020. You remember the Panasonic Slim VR glasses. Well, they've been slightly redesigned. Um, these glasses have been slightly redesigned and improved. And they actually have been improved in a seriously major way. Number one, 
These things ha now have six DOF tracking, which I think is mission critical that we actually have six DOF tracking with this baby now because you can say, well, hey, three DOF is fine. You're sitting in your sofa. You're just enjoying a relaxing VR experience. You don't need six DOF tracking. But, you know, we've used Oculus Go's. I'm sure you've used Oculus Go's when you're sitting in a chair. And if you accidentally move too far this way or too far that way, it kind of breaks the experience a little bit. And it's just an unfortunate thing. That's where I think six DOF, even if it's very basic six DOF, is actually pretty mission critical. I think 3DOF just needs to be left in the dust. I think we'd much rather have a relatively crappy 6DOF that is more designed for you to stay in one really isolated spot, but to give you the freedom to kind of move around a little bit within this bubble and not activate any kind of a problem there. And so this is going to have six DOF tracking built in. It also includes a diopter adjustment, which should allow nearsighted users to be able to use these VR glasses more comfortably. You've got to remember the screens are going to be incredibly close to your eyeballs. One of the designs behind these Panasonic VR glasses is pancake lenses. It's one of the ways that they were able to get the size so small and so slim. And it's going to put the lenses very close to your eyes. And so for people that have problems with being nearsighted, this could be very important. So there's going to be a diopter adjustment um, that is going to be included and that is good as well. And, and so you can see these are the newly redesigned Panasonic Slim VR glasses and we can see that there are the tracking cameras that are now off to the right and left of the upper portion of it. So that has been um, boosted a little bit, made a little bit larger, but that's for the tracking. And then also the actual uh, stems of the glasses that are going to hold it on your ears. Those have been made to be a little bit stronger and they also kind of uh, bend in a little bit more in a different sort of a way that should hopefully add a little bit more so they won't slip off. It won't be as easy for these things to slip off of your head. One of the things that we heard about a handful of people that got to try these glasses a year ago at the January Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas a year ago when it was a physical event some of them mentioned that it had a tendency because you know all the weight is right here and it's resting on the bridge of your nose in one part and it has a tendency to kind of slide off your nose a little bit but you can see the fins in the back are angled in a different kind of a way they're going to grip the sides of your head a little bit better and that should hold hold it on your head a little bit better um, so we've got some redesigns there. So, you know, one of the cool things about this is, um, I mean, what do we think about Panasonic and the Slims? Um, wait, I wanted to see some more designs here. Yeah, so here's an image of the back, and you can see how it's it's been strengthened, and it kind of, it, it kind of bends in, and it has that kind of shark fin design, which should allow it to grip the side, the back side of your, your skull basically a little bit better and hold it a little bit more secure. We also possibly see one of the camera uh, locations. I'm not sure if this actually has four different cameras because we know there's two front facing cameras uh, that are pretty easily visible. And I'm not sure if those are additional side cameras that are on the side as well. We don't have any information regarding controllers and you know the the controller that might accompany this type of device could be like a one-handed not um type of uh, controller you know very simple now see this was a year ago this was at the consumer electronics show a year ago and you can see there was no six dof tracking anywhere uh, the design is pretty much the same other than the fact that it had no six dof tracking and that the shark fins weren't quite as harsh with their inside, you know, digging into the side of your skull so much wasn't quite as harsh there. 
Um, some people wonder, should we care about something like this? Like, is this a big deal? Is this part of our VR future? Well, I mean, there's going to be two different kinds of worlds in VR. There's going to be the gaming world. And for, for us hardcore gamers, I don't think we're going to want to use these things and play synth riders and stuff like that. Uh, or Gorn. I, I don't think we're going to be wanting to use these in very active move around type experiences. But I also believe that there is room for VR to be a very powerful thing for people sitting in a chair, sitting on a sofa. I think sofa VR is going to be a thing where you, you sit on a sofa, you kind of move around a little bit, but you're sitting on a sofa and you're you're enjoying a, a wonderful VR experience, uh, a VR experience that might be non-interactive like Battle Scar, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, and I think there's value here. We eventually need to get to the point where we have a lot of different VR headsets that weigh under 100 grams. I don't remember exactly what the weight of these babies were, but they do have dual 2560 by 2560 micro OLEDs, 2245 on the PPI, very high. So really, really good looking, 120 hertz and high dynamic range. Remember Valve, when they created the Valve Index, a lot of the Valve engineers said that one of the things that really disappointed them was the fact that they were unable to get HDR into the Valve Index. They wanted to, but ultimately they had to abandon it um, at some point. And so we didn't get high dynamic range. And this could be one of the first VR glasses, VR headsets that would actually feature high dynamic range. Now, the big downside there, of course, as you saw the inside of it, is field of view. And unfortunately, that's the big downer here. The field of view is about 70 degrees. And that is where our interest level in this really kind of drops off a cliff. Um, but yeah, these Panasonic VR glasses are interesting, and I think it's great for the VR industry. We're gonna have um, we're gonna have a lot of VR headsets that are gonna go for ultra lightweight and ultra comfort. I need to get a little bit of water here because my throat is tripping. Okay. Yeah. And Technics, um, which is an internal part of Panasonic, is going to be doing the audio. And the audio now is no longer these earbuds like that. The audio is a built in audio, it's an onboard audio that will be very similar to the audio that we have on the Oculus Quest 1, the Oculus Quest 2, the Rift S, and the Oculus Go. But it is Technics, and they are an audio specialist within Panasonic, so hopefully the audio will be up to par. But these are actually the old ones. Uh, so those are the old ones, but we don't have I don't have video footage at least for the new ones. All right, so that is the Panasonic uh, VR glasses, which we're, we're interested in those, not as much as the Samsung. We don't really see these. Um, these seem to be more more of very high-end, very expensive um, for the casual VR crowd. Um, not th These will be great when we legitimately have a video revolution in VR. I, I do believe that we need to have a video revolution. I'm talking volumetric video with NFL, NBA. We haven't had that. If you guys go back to 3D TVs, remember when 3D TVs were all the rage? In fact, Panasonic was one of the earliest manufacturers to get really involved with 3D TVs. Samsung also had a lot of 3D TVs. These were back in the days of Plasma. Remember Plasma TV when Plasma was a big thing? Panasonic had 3D Plasmas. Samsung had 3D Plasmas. And when 3D TV was trying to be a big thing, the World Cup was going on and you could actually watch World Cup games in 3D. Now it was pretty crappy, it didn't work that great and it wasn't that incredible, 
but there was this hope that there was going to be a video revolution and you would be watching all kinds of things in 3D, 3D movies, 3D TV shows, you know, like you'd be watching a TV show like Stranger Things and, and eventually Stranger Things would be in 3D or you'd be watching Survivor, a TV show, and that would become 3D at certain at a certain point. We thought it would be a video revolution. Now, obviously, 3D basically died. It didn't happen. But VR needs its own video revolution. Intel, of course, was pretty big on that with their whole voxel thing. They're changing CEOs like they're changing diapers. So I don't know what's going to happen there. But eventually, we will have some incredible next level volumetric video light fields and things like that. And that's where having a very comfortable set of, of VR glasses are going to be key because you don't need all the extra crap. You're just enjoying the visuals of something. And so I could see that being really, really key. Okay, so that is the Panasonic VR glasses. All right, well, one of the next things that I wanted to get into here, let's go ahead and switch back over to the Webinator. It's been some time, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to go to Upload VR really quick here. And one of the big stories that has been going on in uh, VR gaming, actually, let's see here. Let me go to Road to VR. Maybe it'll be easier. Um, so one of the big stories that's going on in the VR gaming world is that changes are coming to the Oculus Quest account system, to multi-user accounts, app sharing, and also the future of side quests that we, as we know it. All of these things are kind of up in the air now. And there was an interview with uh, Boz, basically, uh, with Addy. Uh, Addy Robertson of The Verge had an interview with Boz, and he released a lot of information um, in this interview. And so they're talking about, basically, there's going to be a multi-user feature, which will allow you to add up to three secondary accounts to a single device. App sharing will additionally give primary account holders the ability to share their library of apps between those secondary local profiles. It's kind of complicated, man. Let me tell you, I, I read all about it and it made my head spin a little bit. And and this is this is something that people have been asking for for a long time when it comes to Oculus is like, man, why do I have to buy an individual Oculus Quest headset for every seat, you know, for every person in the house, I got to get separate Oculus Quest headsets. That just seems absolutely ridiculous. Okay, I'm going to click on this one because I think they kind of break it down in a slightly better way here. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's kind of convoluted. Okay, it's convoluted to a degree. Okay, um, both primary and secondary accounts will still require a Facebook login. So that's kind of a Debbie Downer, and I can explain why that is kind of a Debbie Downer, in my opinion, because I actually have my own problem right now. I have two different Oculus accounts. It's, it's a freaking annoying situation that I'm dealing with here and having these two different Oculus accounts. And, and people might wonder, Anthony, why would you have two Oculus accounts? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because I'm part of different organizations okay i have myself as an individual person but i'm also part of vr roundtable and i'm also part of this and i'm also part of that so there's there's a number of people that are in this industry especially if you're kind of in the press you know i'm kind of like this like pseudo journalist with vrgamerankings.com not a legit journalist i'm not even going to try to pretend that i'm a legit journalist at all um but you could end up having multiple Oculus accounts. It wasn't that big of a deal before this whole Facebook thing happened, you know, before the Facebook login thing happened. And then once the Facebook login thing happened, then now you have this huge dilemma like, oh my God, I only have one personal Facebook account, yet I have multiple Oculus accounts. What do I do? Well, I was kind of in that dilemma myself. And when I got my Oculus Quest 2, it requires you must link, like, like uh, the, the account that you put on an Oculus Quest 2 
must be linked with Facebook. So right now on my Oculus Quest 2 headset, I have my VR Roundtable account, which is linked to my actual Facebook account. On my Oculus Quest 1, which I still have that thing, that thing has my VR Game Rankings account, which is not linked to anything. And it's able to survive like that as long as I don't put it on the Oculus Quest 2. Like I said, it's an unbelievably convoluted kind of situation. So when I first heard about multi-user accounts, I thought, yes, finally, I'll be able to use all my accounts anywhere and everything will work good. No, because here's the thing. Yeah, so the, the, the secondary account also requires a Facebook login. So that's one of the little... The little deals here um, it also gets it gets even more complicated like it talks about <laughs> okay so based off the information above it seems that for a household with multiple quest headsets the best option would be to have only one person's account logged in as the primary account on all devices with other members then logged into their own headsets as secondary accounts if everything is purchased on the primary account, then all the users in the family would have equal access to the same content without... This is going to be so effing complicated, man. It's gonna, like you're going to need your own private lawyer that you're going to have to consult. Can I play this game on this head? You know, shit was just so much more simple back in the days. Back in the days, you bought an effing game and you plugged it into your console. And if your buddy wanted to borrow it, you pulled it out and you gave it to him. It was a physical thing. Now, some of the sharing capabilities in our modern world is actually a little bit better. Because, like, you know, if we're back in the old Super Nintendo days and I bought Super Metroid and my cousin in Iowa is like, dude, I really want to borrow your Super Metroid. Well, back in 1992, Two or whenever Super Metroid came out, I would have to take my Super Metroid cartridge, put it in a little mail package, and send it off to Iowa or Ohio or wherever I was talking about. And that kind of sucks. So now we're in this modern day, you can actually share stuff online. That is really cool. One thing that I don't know about though is like the actual legal ramifications of this. Now, I know the EU, the European Union, has certain requirements in relation to this. And that's why I think we have like Steam, Steam Family Share and all this stuff. And like PlayStation has, you know, primary account, secondary account. Microsoft has the same kind of thing. And yeah, if you're a family with, you know, several people in your house, you can play this little game where, okay, I'll be primary on this box, you're secondary on that one, and then if you buy a game, then I get to play it too, and if I buy a game, you get to play it too. You know, there's all these, like, crazy things. It's really quite complicated. The bottom line, though, is Facebook accounts for everybody, man. You got to have a Facebook account on these things. This is a secret little sneaky kind of a way just for them to get that many more Facebook accounts. At first, people thought, no way, Oculus is never going to do this because they would much rather a family with three kids have to buy three different Oculus headsets. They don't want a family with three kids buying a singular Oculus Quest headset and then everybody like sharing that one headset. That would suck for Facebook. Well, not exactly, because if they can require everybody to have their own Facebook account, now you're talking 10 to the 10th power of that many more Facebook accounts that will be created with real names, real information, more data scraping, more users for Facebook. Let's remember, if, you're, if the number of users that you have annually, all of a sudden, for whatever platform you have, you want your number of users to always increase exponentially. If the number of users start to plateau and fall off, not very good for your stock price. So Facebook, you know, they'll cry bloody murder about all the different fake accounts that are out there and they don't want fake accounts. But on the other side, I mean, just look at Steam. Look at Steam. How many people have like seven different Steam accounts? You know you have quite a few. Everybody has multiple Steam accounts. People have multiple Facebook accounts. I mean, I know they're shutting this down, but 
it's pretty convoluted. But I mean, there is some good news here. Um, this is something we've all been asking for for a long time. And then the other aspect of this is the non-store app distribution coming sooner than people think. This is also happening as well. So the whole side quest thing that is going on, you know, that is potentially in some sort of danger. We don't really know danger, Will Robinson, danger. We don't really know exactly how all of this is going to unravel, but it appears that it's going to unravel in the month of February. This is coming very soon. And I just got another super chat. Hussein X, thanks so much with the super chat. He says, hello, Anthony and everyone. Great to see a news format live stream show going on. I miss the god old day, the good old days when I got a daily dose of it. Yeah, this is kind of like an old school version of VR365. I used to do a show like this every day. How freaking crazy was that? Yeah, the idea was VR365, VR gaming news and discussion, 365 days a year, 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 year. That's what it was supposed to be. Didn't really happen. I mean, no, it happened for a little while. I was unemployed at the time, then got called back into work, and all of that died a brutal death. But yeah, so... Um, these apps are going to be coming. Uh, it's going to be much easier. You're not going to have to do the side quest route. You're not going to have to pretend that you're a developer. You know, you're not going to have to jump through these extra hoops. So that's going to be nice. Um, we're looking forward to that. Also, there is another thing that we need to mention in terms of like, <clears throat> in terms of this whole account sharing thing and primary accounts and secondary accounts, there could be some major disruption, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this is more of some inside baseball. This is gonna be some inside baseball that is not gonna affect a lot of you out there. This is more for people that are like members of podcasts or you're like in some kind of organization or like developers and stuff like that. Because see, there's a dirty little secret about the Oculus Rift and the Oculus Quest and the Oculus Go, basically the entire Oculus ecosystem. There's a dirty little secret that nobody really talks about very much. But Oculus's system, there's something weird about Oculus's system. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it out loud, all right? So VR Roundtable is a podcast. We had an Oculus account that was very specific for VR Roundtable. Now, we would go to various developers and we'd say, hey, could we get a key for this? Could we get a key for that? Now, the developers would not give us four individual keys so that I can have my key, Steve could have, have his key, Chris and Gary could have their own keys. No, developers would give us one key. So the one key would go to the VR Roundtable Oculus account. Now, amazingly enough, amazingly enough, Gary could be in England. Chris could be in like Maine, damn near, or Vermont. Steve could be in Kentucky. I would be in California. And we could be logged in to the same Oculus account on different devices, playing different games. I don't know if it all works simultaneously or if there was like certain problems where we couldn't both be online at the same time, but but essentially, essentially you could share an Oculus account with a gang of people. I mean, I don't know if there was limits on it. I don't know if you could share the same Oculus account with like nine different people and nine different people could just sign into the same account and play the same, like, that is not the way things are supposed to be. Now, it was great for us that we were having a podcast and we had four different people and all four of the same people wanted to be able to try uh, the same game and be able to talk about it. So it worked great for that. And we didn't feel like we were doing anything necessarily illegal. We might have been violating some terms of service technically, but because we were a podcast and we're like selling this stuff by talking about it, we felt like we were justified and everything was okay. And there was no system that was designed to like disrupt that and negate that. 
However, I do believe now that we are going to this new system, this primary account, secondary account, multiple users, and how you could like you could have your account on up to three different devices. Like this is a sea change. This is a whole new thing. So I got to imagine that the Oculus Store, the Oculus Store, the, the whole backbone of the Oculus Store might be completely revamped for Oculus Rift and Oculus Quest because for all these years, like I guarantee you there's people out there that are sharing an Oculus Quest account with like 10 different people. I bet you any amount of money there are people doing that. And so one person buys Gorn for their Quest coming on January 28th, spoiler for an upcoming story that we're going to talk about. One person could do that and all 10 people are playing Gorn. I don't think Oculus like enjoys that. I don't think Free Lives and 24-bit games, the developer that handled the port, enjoy that. You know, so so what I'm what I'm trying to say here is when all these changes come, there could be all these different people that are like in developer groups and in these different podcasts and stuff where they were all sharing accounts and all that bam, all that eliminated, all that canceled out. Inside baseball, I know it doesn't really affect a lot of you people. But um, but yeah, it's just an interesting thing. Um, Pseudo Soul in chat, let me see here. Um should we switch over to chat? Pseudo Soul says you'll have to apply for a press account, maybe. I don't think they have that. They should. They should have that. Um, so yeah, it's it's weird. It's a weird thing, and it's it's like a you know it's like a dirty little secret that nobody talks about. Um, Chris Richardson says, how does Nintendo handle multiple accounts? Nintendo's a little bit draconian with it. But I, I believe for the EU, they probably have to have some kind of deal with primary and secondary. I'm not sure exactly how that all works out. <clears throat> okay, but yeah, but bottom line, anyway, in the month of February, we've got some dramatic changes, dramatic changes potentially for side quests, dramatic changes with multi-accounts, uh, dramatic changes for people that are in podcasts. Uh, so all of that is going to be certainly interesting. Okay, another story that we wanted to get into is Gorn. Yes, Gorn has already previously been announced for the Oculus Quest, uh, which makes perfect sense. You know, it is a relatively 360 degree type of experience and the graphics aren't incredibly advanced. So here is one of the very first screenshots for Gorn running on the Oculus Quest. And the actual developer here is 24-bit games. Free Lives is, of course, the developer of Gorn, but 24-bit games handled the port of Gorn to PlayStation VR. They're also handling the port from Gorn to Oculus Quest. And we've been wondering for a long time. This was supposed to be out very late last year. Obviously, that didn't happen. Got delayed a little bit. It is coming on January 28th. We have two different screenshots have that have been revealed. That is one of them right there. You can see uh, the skybox leaves a little bit to be desired there. Um, a little bit of some graphical reductions here. This is the second screenshot that we have. And, you know, the real key here for Gorn, what I've always said about Gorn, it's all about um, collision detection. You know, it's all about hit detection for me in this game. That's what Gorn is all about. Gorn had better collision slash hit detection than pretty much any VR game I've ever played ever. And that's its claim to fame. Because when you're doing melee, when you're hitting something, you know, and you're hitting something and you're wearing it down, like you hit pieces of the armor and it, and it like degrades a little bit. You hit it again and it starts to fall off a little bit. You hit it again and it falls off completely. It's that collision detection, that hit detection, that was the key aspect of Gorn. That's kind of what made Gorn the game that it is. And the question is, is will the physics running on the Snapdragon 835 that's on the Oculus Quest 1, is it going to be up to the task? Oculus Quest 2 with the XR2 chipset, take a drink 
every time Sebastian from MRTV mentions the XR2 chipset. <laughs> it's funny, the last little uh, episode we did, he likes saying XR2 chipset. Um, the XR2 chipset could definitely calculate these collisions and physics a little bit better, but it's got to be backwards compatible to Quest 1 and work perfectly fine as there. So we'll see how that works out. Now, the game is $20 on PC and PlayStation VR, although the PlayStation VR game is $5 off right now in a temporary sale, I believe, to like January 19th. So you got a few more days on that. The question is, will this be $20 when it hits Quest? Will this be $19.99 on Quest? Or will there be a slight Quest tax? Yeah, every once in a while, we do get a Quest tax where a quest a quest game might be like 19.99 everywhere else but on the quest 24.99 and some people might wonder well why do they do that well they do that because of the popularity there's just so many people that have quests so many people buying quest games they can they can basically juice you a little bit more that's what they're trying to do here they're trying to juice you a little bit so there is that so quest is headed to, um, I mean, Gorn is headed to the Oculus Quest on January 28th. We're definitely looking forward to that one. All right. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, folks, is a number of different experiences that I've tried recently. And uh, let's see, let's switch over to the Webinator here. And I want to, yeah, there's a PSVR tax as well. Absolutely. Um, but I want to switch to the Quest Store. Okay, so here's the Oculus Quest Store. Let me go ahead and refresh this. And I got to tell you, man, say whatever you want about the Oculus Quest. But, I mean, they are very heavy-handed with how they... Um, prevent different games from coming and deciding which games are able to come and all of that but it's been pretty strong in quest world like if we take a look at the new releases you know just a lot of strong stuff so we had a couple of experiences that have arrived very recently on the oculus quest two different experiences both of them going for 5.99 battle scar punk was invented by girls baba yaga Mare also came out on the Quest, something called Hollow Fit Invasion Anniversary Edition. So you can see, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. I wanted to talk briefly, though, about this thing. Okay, so this is free. It's called We Live Here. And there's a number of free things like this. Now, at first, I thought this was just like a 360 video. And I'm like, oh, this is just going to be some crappy 360 video. Who really cares about this? Does anybody want to see a 360 video? Not really, right? But on VRGameRankings.com, we have a breakdown where we talk about the best free Oculus Quest experiences. And because this is a free Oculus Quest experience, I was like, I better try this. It's free. Let me get in there and try it. And I can, you know, add it to the ranking on VRGameRankings.com. So, you know, we live here can be a part of the stuff that I have ranked. And so I tried it you know, almost forcing myself to try it, really. Like, not really wanting to try it, but forcing myself to try it because, eh, I got to try this. Some crappy 360 video. It's going to be dumb. Well, I tried this out, ladies and gentlemen, and I got to tell you, not exactly dumb. It's more than just a 360 video. In fact, part of this reminded me of, like, Anne Frank House a little bit. They actually do some decent stuff here with this particular production. And so it initially starts out as a 360 video, but then at a certain point, you basically are inside this lady's tent and they recreate the tent in like a game engine and kind of like a photogrammetry, photogrammetry type thing. And you're able to pick up some different objects. And as you pick up these different objects, different stories start playing. And some of the stories then, boom, go throughout your, you know, take over your Oculus Quest headset. And you're inside a different scene. For example, like this horse running around and some of the different scenes that they play. And, you know, it uses different music and all this stuff. And it's actually quite good. And what is this all about anyways? What are we talking about? What is We Live Here? Well, if we go back to the webinator and see here, uh, 
Rocky lives in a tent in a park. We meet her on the day police and sanitation workers come to clear the park of the homeless people seeking shelter here. Rocky flees, unable to salvage her personal belongings. Through interactivity, explore Rocky's personal objects, objects that hold Rocky's memories and illustrate her past. Pick up her journal to reveal an animated poem, yada, yada, yada. And that's kind of the way this works. And it's actually halfway decent. This is worth downloading. This is worth experiencing. And the thing is, here in the United States, like I know we've got a number of viewers that are in Europe, in the UK, um, in various places around the world. But I can tell you that here in the United States, we have a ginormous problem with homelessness. It is out of control. I happen to live in California and California is seriously affected by this like you would not believe. If you went down to Los Angeles in the LA area, there are certain areas of LA where it's tense as far as the eye can see. I mean, you can drive miles down certain roads and just see tent after tent after tent. And basically what it is, there's always been a homeless problem. You know, there's always been a problem of homelessness. As long as I've been alive, there's always been homeless people. But in the first, like, I don't know how many years of my life, like you really wouldn't encounter homeless people that often. You know, every once in a while you'd see a homeless person here or there and be like, oh man, that person's homeless. But it is an epidemic now like none other, especially in the state of California. And a lot of it is real estate prices are out of control. Rents are out of control. There are regular people that have legitimate jobs. They're holding down legitimate jobs and they can't afford a place to live. It sounds ridiculous. Like it's like, oh, if you have a job, you're living somewhere, right? Not necessarily. There's people living out of their cars. There's people living in tents. And so I, I think what was really cool about this experience is VR has often been described as an empathy machine that allows, you know, it, it, it can put you in the shoes of someone else and you can experience a slice of their life and, and, and kind of get a different viewpoint from that. And I think this does a pretty good job of that. So I think it's well worth trying out. Um, it's, it's actually halfway decent and it's 100% free. Um, you know, we can still have lots of debates on, you know, whether or not homeless people like accidentally find themselves in a situation like this, or have they made bad life decisions? And that gets into a whole complicated thing. And it's really hard to break, break that down. But I will say we live here definitely worth trying. I was actually legitimately impressed with that. All right, now another experience um, that came to the Oculus Quest store very recently. Uh, let's go ahead and back up, <clears throat> excuse me, is Invasion Anniversary Edition. So this came to the Oculus Quest very recently. This has been around for a long time. Like I remember this in the early days of VR. Like I think we might, this might've been out in like 2016 originally invasion by baobab studios and it's finally come to the oculus quest it's free now this is a 360 video so all it is is a 360 video so nothing to see here right move along move along well it's actually um let me go ahead and grab the trailer for it um even though it's a completely non-interactive 360 video where you can't really do anything. All you can do is stand in one place and basically turn around and look at it. It's done in such a way that it will almost trick you into thinking that it's like some kind of like game engine experience that is taking place within a game engine that is truly three-dimensional, but it's not. It's, it's all flat backgrounds, but basically things are in the background of the environment. They come forward and you know different things happen this is the anniversary edition again it's another little free thing to try out and it's halfway decent it's pretty cool it's nothing spectacular but i can recommend it as something for everybody to try out if you've got a brand new oculus quest 2 or you got an oculus quest and you're looking for a free little experience to try out might as well go ahead and check it out it's halfway decent 
that is invasion. Okay, um, now let's go ahead and get into Battle Scar. So if we go back to the Webinator and we go back to uh, recently released on the Oculus Quest, you'll see that one of the newest things to arrive is Battle Scar. Punk was invented by girls. And I saw this, I actually saw this on Steam. I was looking at like upcoming VR games and experiences and things that were on Steam. And I saw this as an upcoming thing that's on Steam. It's not available on Steam right now. So the only place that you can get this right now at this very moment is on the Oculus Quest, but it is gonna be coming to other platforms as well. Um, but one of the things that caught my eye was Rosario Dawson, of course, uh, the, the famous actress. She plays um, one of the, the main roles. That's in, basically the main person, really, in this feature. There's kind of two main people, and she plays one of them. And so you hear her voice, and I heard, oh, yeah, there's this thing with Rosario Dawson, and it's supposed to be very artsy-fartsy, man. It's very artsy-fartsy. You know, Battle Scar was selected at Sundance, Tribeca, Venice International, and Annecy Film Festival. So yeah, it's a little bit on the artsy fartsy side, but the developer is Atlas Five, and these guys and gals have legitimate skills. They've done some pretty incredible shit in the past. So I was pretty hyped to try this. I wanted to check this out. And luckily enough, I was able, I was provided a key to be able to try this out. And I did check it out last night. It lasts for about a half an hour. And uh, let me go ahead and grab the trailer for it, throw it on here, and I can talk about this experience myself. The price on this is $5.99, six bucks. And of course, that's a whole other debate within itself is this idea of buying experiences and are do you buy any experiences or do you only go for the free ones? So you go for stuff like We Live Here and Invasion and, and different free experiences that come down the pipe, but you never get any of these paid experiences. Or are you somebody that does dabble with these paid experiences? And we can get into questions of, well, how much is too much? How much should these things cost? How long should they last? Is it good enough? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I was really interested in trying this out. I like experiences. I don't, you know, VR games are great. And obviously I'm more of a gamer than anything and I'm really into VR games and that's my primary thing. But you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater if you're not also enjoying VR experiences because some of the best stuff that we have is very short experiences that kind of, this is uncharted territory, man. Nobody knows what they're really doing yet. So there's a lot of experimentation. Everybody's experimenting, trying to figure this out. Atlas Five working on this particular uh, production here. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed with this production, to be completely honest. I, I would love to be able to come on here and rant and rave and say, oh my God, this is the best $5.99, $5.99 you'll ever spend. It's six bucks. It's well worth it. You got to do it. This is one of the most amazing experiences in VR. I wanted to say that. I can't really say that. Is it a good experience? Is it interesting? Is it unique? Do they use a lot of different little diorama tricks where they, they have this tiny little diorama that you're looking at with little characters running around and then it expands out and it becomes your entire your entire uh, visual world. And then, you know, they, they have words kind of dancing around, different little effects are going on. The story's pretty interesting. The story gets a little bit dark and deep. I mean, they get into drugs and heroin and, and stuff at, at a certain point. And it's kind of about punk. And it's basically about these two runaways um, and, and the situation that happens to them. It's set in 1978. That was another thing that partly appealed to me was like, oh, it's kind of, you know, it's set in 1978, New York City in the late 70s, you know, that whole vibe, what would that be like? 
I don't know that I got a lot of that vibe. I mean, there there definitely was this punk rock vibe that was going through this whole thing here. Rosario Dawson, I mean, she did okay with it. I didn't notice anything particularly spectacular. Um, it's strong, you know. It, it's it's a solid production. This is definitely not an awful production from Atlas Five. This is not going to like ruin their uh, reputation or anything like that. But I don't know that I would um, run out there and tell everybody to try this out. Now, again, I, I've tried this on the Oculus Quest. Is it possible that you could try this, uh, the Steam VR version, on a higher-end PC VR setup? Maybe it's more impressive. Maybe the Oculus Quest version had to be watered down considerably to be able to work good on the Quest. Not exactly sure. Haven't tried the Steam version, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of say, okay, meh, kind of meh. I'm kind of meh on it. I'll probably write an article on VR Game Rankings about it. But um, yeah, I mean, I wish I could be way more, way more thumbs up about it than I am, but uh, still relatively decent. All right, so that is Battle Scar, which is out available now on your Oculus Quest. All right, I did want to talk about a couple of other experiences that I've been screwing around with on my Oculus Quest. And of course, I can't go without talking about Jurassic Park Aftermath, which I continue to play this slowly but surely. You know, I know people are like, dude, Anthony, this thing only lasts like a couple of hours. You should have finished this on the very first day. Well, I don't play my games like that. That's not the way I play games. I play games in like 25, 35 minute bursts. And if I start, if a game starts to get tedious for me, you know, I bounce to something else, you know, and I, I bounce to some other experience or game. And I like to bounce around between like five, six, seven different things at a time. Part of the reason I never finish anything. If I just was like, no, I must finish this from beginning to end. I will not play anything. I will not try any other experience until I finish Jurassic World Aftermath. Yes, I would finish more things, but that's not the way I am when it comes to these games. So I am continuing to play this. I'm a little bit further in it. And you know what? I've kind of turned a corner on this game a little bit. I'm not as in love with it. I, I don't like it as much as I originally did. I still enjoy it. There's still aspects of it I really like. And you know, one interesting aspect about this is it reminds me a lot of Westworld Awakening which was one of my favorite games of 2019. I, I'll tell you right now, I believe Westworld Awakening is one of the five or six best games to come out in the entire year of 2019. And this game actually reminds me of it in a couple of ways. Number one is the environmental storytelling. So as you're going through this game, there's a lot of monitors and screens where they're flickering, they're malfunctioning, and there's something cool about that. Even though this is much more comical and cartoony, so it isn't as photo real, like that was one of the big things of Westworld Awakening is when you get into the second and third and fourth level and you're in the Delos facility, like the way they did the graphics was so freaking fantastic. But like, see that screen on that wall that's like flickering and malfunctioning? There's a lot of that going on. There's posters and things that are on the wall. And, and just, you, you kind of get a certain vibe that definitely reminds me of Westworld Awakening. And then the gameplay, unfortunately, unfortunately the gameplay is very similar to Westworld Awakening. And which I thought was maybe one of the worst aspects of Westworld Awakening. Because basically in the gameplay, you're basically going from one table to another table to another table. Um, Westworld Awakening didn't have lockers, but it did have lots of tables that you hid under. And it was the same type of thing. It's like hide under a table. Okay, the guy has walked far enough away, the ax murderer guy. Well, in this case, we're talking about the raptors. The raptors have ran far enough away. I've got 10 seconds to try to manipulate this certain puzzle. Oh no, I ran out of time back underneath the table. That's kind of what you're doing in this game. And it's kind of like, 
it kind of goes too much. We got to do better than this, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I still like this game. I still would recommend it to somebody that is not anti-stealth. But tediousm is a is a reality. You know, this does get tedious after a while. You're, you know, you're hiding under one table. It's like, oh, I get, I made it a little farther to another table. Now I made it to a locker. Yay. You know, and then you're, you're, you know, you're slowly working your way through. I do like the way they did a lot of the menu systems and stuff. You know, you put your hand on this menu, a thing opens up, you're using different levers and stuff. I thought that was pretty clever. And um, so I'm still a fan of this, um, but I just don't. I don't love it as much as I thought I loved it, um, but I still think it's pretty good. I still think it's cool, but yeah, uh, definitely tedious on the gameplay at a certain point. Now, I can tell you something that does not get tedious, and this is on the Oculus Quest, and I talked about it before, and I've, I've talked about it like on the last episode. I want to talk about it just for a quick second again because God damn it, this game is incredible. This is Racket in X on the Oculus Quest. I've been playing this on my Oculus Quest 2, okay? Because it's on my VR it's on the VR Roundtable Oculus Quest account which is linked to my Facebook and it is on my Oculus Quest 2 and everything's great about that. And I'm, so anytime I grab my Oculus Quest 2, I'm going to jump into this for about 20 minutes at least. I'm going to get some little Racket and X action on. And I just feel like it is just the perfect marriage of visuals, sound effects, audio. The gameplay is comfortable. It's understandable. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of complaints. So a lot of people are like, why do you like this so much, man? I bought this. I played it for a half an hour. I don't see what you, I don't know what you think about this, man. I played this for like 25 minutes, man. I played it for 25 minutes. What do you see in this? Okay, you got to play it longer than a half an hour. You got to play it longer than an hour. You might need to play this for like a couple of hours. Although I wouldn't play it for like an hour straight. There's a lot of VR games that are perfect in like a 30 minute burst. You play it for 30 minutes and you go off to something else. You don't need to play this for four hours in a row. This is something that you go into, you give it a little love, you bounce out, you go to something else. But like this is my number one demo material. If I'm ever going to, uh, I'm not demoing my Oculus Quest to anybody right now just because of this whole COVID thing and all that. I'm not like scared of COVID and all that, but I'm not about to give my VR headset and put it on someone else's greasy face. So I haven't been doing much of that. But if I, if I was demoing my headset, my Quest, I would absolutely put somebody in this game. Because all it's, it's a racket and a ball. You only need to turn on one Quest controller. So you can leave your other Quest controller sitting on the table over there. One Quest controller, it's a ball. You hit it against the wall. You're, you're just trying, like, like you do some different tennis shots. I used to play tennis in real life, and I got legit skills, all right? McEnroe Jr., they used to call me back in the days. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, no, I, I had this one-handed backhand that was just so freaking wicked. Like, I could just do this one-handed backhand that would just... Just freaking kill fools. Like if this, if it went in, as long as it wasn't out, unreturnable backhand that I used to have. Um, so I know how to put spin on stuff and I know how to kind of do that. So maybe because I know some of these like real tennis maneuvers, I'm having an even better time than most people. But there's so many modes. There's so many different modes to this game. And I feel like one Hamza... I hope a One Hamza developer watches this. One Hamza, I got an awesome tip for you right now that I'm going to put publicly on this channel live on air. Okay, so you got this beautiful arena, right, that wraps all around you that you're interacting with. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do with this concept of, a, of an arena that wraps around you. You basically have unlimited possibilities of what you can do with this arena. I can imagine that you can make part of the arena like where it's like an aquarium and you see fish that are swimming and then you hit the ball against that and then psh, it breaks the glass and then water starts leaking out and then maybe some of the fish are swimming around you as you're playing. Just one little idea I'm throwing out there. Another idea I have is 
as you're moving around this 360 arena, how about some full motion video? What if there was some full motion video of some dumb memes or something and you got to hit the meme and kill it and it switches to a different one or something like that? So I, I think they can have like little windows of full motion video that's good. There's just a lot of interesting things that could be done here. There's various power ups. The, the sound effects, people don't realize one Hamza not a video game developer. They are sound. They're, they're like sound technicians. They came up with Racket NX as a demo just to show off their sound technology. But the demo was so good and so many people liked it. They're like, you got to keep building this out. This is like a legitimate game. Keep running with this. And so they did. But the sound effects, every sound effect, like you could try playing this game, turn the music all the way down, just hear the sound effects, and you'll appreciate how the sound is so effing 3D. Like there is real 3D. Everything in this game is, is it's relatively simplistic, like graphically, but like all the little meters, like everything has a logic. There's nothing super. Su there, there's no wasted information going on here. Like the meters, um, your, your power meter, your health, all of that, all of it makes sense. It's just fantastic. It's a, it's a fantastic, the, the voice samples, it's all good. They freaking killed it. They absolutely killed it. Much love, true respect, you know, racking an X. And, and then the slowdown, like when the ball, you know, when the ball goes down that lane and then it's like zzz, slows down, that's when you, you know, you have your rug and you're like, oh, and then you smack it against the wall and it like creates like this like ice effect and shit. There's different effects where they like have glass over some of the things. You got to break the glass, you shatter the glass and then like, dude, they, they keep updating this game. They keep improving it. It's improved by leaps and bounds. And the last time I talked about this game, I said it was $29.99. I was like, that's the one downer. Why is it 30 bucks? Well, somehow I had it confused with something else. It's $19.99. So the price is 20 bucks. And, and if you don't like this game, you simply haven't played it long enough. That's all there is to it. Or you might need to see a doctor. You might need to see a doctor. All right. Well, I think that's basically what I wanted to cover today. Let me see if I had any other little things I wanted to mention. No, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm definitely excited just to kind of wrap wrap things up. I'm excited about Bugovision. I'm tremendously excited, man. I don't have a daily driver, and I need a daily driver in my life, and I'm hoping that Samsung will deliver me, man. And I got to say, dude, there's no other company that I would, I, I, I've been looking for Samsung. I've been hoping that Samsung could be that company. You know, They are one of the best consumer electronics manufacturers in all the world. Very well-respected company, doing really nice things. I would love to see what they could do with the VR headset if they're not encumbered by any Windows Mixed Reality 1.0 or anything like that. You know, we've got brand new controller designs and maybe this is, this could be Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. There could be an announcement. There could be a Microsoft announcement. This could kind of be kind of a leak. You know, this could kind of be a leak that has spoiled Windows Mixed Reality 2.0 a little bit. That could be a possibility. So really looking forward to that. Hoping to get my pre-order in, man. I want to get my pre-order. I want to get my pre-order in and buy this puppy. But yeah, guys, um, that's pretty much gonna wrap it up for this episode of VR365. Um, I did want to mention that you can also catch me, of course, on the next Dimension podcast over on MRTV's channel. I believe we're going to have an episode tomorrow at noon Pacific time. I think I'm on the episode. I'm not 100% positive because sometimes um, it's kind of better sometimes if we only have three people on that podcast because when we have four people, it goes like three hours. Three people, it's a little less people. 
So I might miss an episode here or there, um, but I've been enjoying my time on Next Dimension Podcast. I think it's good for VR365. Like one of the main reasons I'm doing it is to expose this channel to an entirely new group of people that maybe have never heard of me before, never heard of VR365, and then they can come over here to VR365 and check out some of the shows that are going on over here. So anyway, that will go ahead and do it. Check me out on Next Dimension Podcast tomorrow. And I'll be back with some more VR365 content in the very near future. So stay tuned for that. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this particular episode. We'll see you guys next time. Everybody have a good one. Take it easy and later.